Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. Today, we're discussing Il Colibri, or The Hummingbird, by Italian Sandro Veronese, the internationally best-selling and prize-winning novel that fellow author Leila Slimani called a real masterpiece, a funny, touching, profound book that made me cry like a little girl on the last page. Since publication in 2019, the book has won high-profile awards and effusive praise from authors and readers, with the English-language version published in 2021. What is all the fuss about? Laura's Book Club found out. To catch us up with their debate and add a little more, we're joined by pod regular Phil Chafee and first-timer Joe Norman, both members of Laura's Book Club. Keep listening to find out if the hummingbird kept us turning the pages or was it abandoned by our bedsides. And whether we loved it or loathed it, the big question is, was it a good book club book? We'll also be bringing you our recommendations for books by international authors we think you shouldn't overlook. All that coming up, here on the Book Club Review. Joe and Phil, so excited to have you both on. Phil wasn't actually in Book Club with Joe and me when we discussed it, so keen to know what you thought. I'm sure you have views. And Kate, you teased a few opinions, I feel on Instagram. I've had to wait a long old time to discuss this book because I read this back when you first said that your book club were doing it but then I didn't have a book club to discuss it with and then we had our summer break didn't we so there was a whole other month. I've just had all these thoughts simmering away. One thing I'm slightly fretful about is how we're going to manage to talk about this book without spoilers because it's the way it's written it feels like it's important to consider the way he structured it and the various events that take place but at the same time I don't want to spoil it for anyone who's going to read it. It's definitely tricky because there is a lot to talk about as the book comes to its denouement. I think even the Lila Slimani quote teases that when she says she was in tears on the last page. I think it's fair to say it's a book which deals with one man's whole life. And so within that, naturally, it comes to the end of his life. So I think it's not a huge spoiler to say that we are going to find out what happens to this man at the end of his life. But perhaps more than that, we shouldn't go into too many details. Just to say what it's about, The Hummingbird tells the story of Marco Carrera from his early years until the end of his life, encompassing his family and friends and formative experiences. Written in fragmentary style, the text jumps around chronologically and stylistically, incorporating lists, emails and other ephemera. The audiobook is read by Kristin Atherton, Silvia Presente and Victor Vettuni. Here's a clip. Throughout his childhood, Marco Carrera hadn't noticed anything. He hadn't noticed his parents were fighting all the time. He hadn't noticed his mother's hostile indifference, his father's exasperating silences, the hushed-up quarrels at night, their voices lowered to a whisper so the children wouldn't hear. And yet his sister Irene did hear them and took a perverse pleasure in meticulously recording every detail in her memory. He didn't know the reason behind those rows, those fights that were so transparent to his sister. The reason was that his mother, a southerner called Letizia, meaning joy, which couldn't have been further from the truth, and his father, a northerner who was true to his name Probo, which meant honest, were simply not made for each other, despite both of them being expats of sorts in Florence. They had practically nothing in common. In fact, there were perhaps no two people less alike on the face of the earth. She was an architect, all abstract thought and revolutionary ideas. He was an engineer, all calculations and practicality. She had been sucked into the vortex of radical architecture. He was the best-scale model builder in central Italy. Where to begin? I've written writing style, fragments, <laughs> skips around. I mean, there's just so much, isn't there? Can I make a suggestion that we turn to the note from the translator, Elena Pala? There's a note from her at the very back of my edition. The opening paragraph, I thought, does such a good job of introing the book and perhaps some of the challenges of translating it, but crucially giving a sense of our main character. 
When I first read The Hummingbird in Italian, I felt as though I had gotten ten books for the price of one. Marco Carrera starts off as a hapless, almost comical husband caught in a lie by his wife's therapist. But as the story unfolds, or rather folds and folds on itself, we get the true measure of a man who, as the Beckettian epigraph suggests, just kept going against all odds. And that epigraph that she mentions is, I can't go on, I'll go on. Samuel Beckett quote. Yeah, you wouldn't think that a book that starts with a Beckett quote would be quite so readable and page turning. <laughs> oh, yes, I suppose there is that. I hadn't thought of it that way. But yes, I suppose you could. <laughs> you could describe it as that. There's something I'd like to get out of the way, which is all of the praise that this book has garnered, particularly from other novelists. So Ian McEwan wrote, The Hummingbird is a masterly novel, a brilliantly conceived mosaic of love and tragedy. Veronese creates a thought-rich and ultimately comic meditation on human error and lost chances. It is a cabinet of curiosities and delights, packed with small wonders, strange and sudden turns, insights of great poise and unusual cultural reference points. The Hummingbird is an object lesson in authorial control. Veronese truly knows and loves all matters of the heart. While our old friend Howard Jacobson says somehow or other Sandro Veronese pulls off the extraordinary feat of making you believe he is writing for your ears alone. I cannot tell you what The Hummingbird is about, because that would be to betray a confidence. But I can tell you it's a mightily clever novel. While Michael Cunningham said, A profound story about the myriad ways in which human passions collide with forces beyond human control. From its first page to its last, it's as full of surprises as it is jolts of recognition. Sandro Veronese has overcome the ultimate and most difficult of any novelist's challenge. He has created a story of such depth and scope that it can stand unembarrassed alongside life itself. It is a remarkable accomplishment, a true gift to the world. Richard Ford, Brody Doyle, Edward Carey, all also piled in the praises, and one woman, Jhumpa Lahiri. This is in my edition. These are the people that were mentioned at the beginning. And I just have to say, when I read all that, I was like, did they read a different book? <laughs> There was such a profound <laughs> disconnect between the general way that this book seems to have been received and my experience of reading it. And so I'm very curious to know, were your book club's fans? I mean, what did you think of it? Joe? I think for the majority, we loved it up to a certain point. You loved it. We loved it, but up to a very... We did. We loved it. We did, but up to a very specific point in the novel. And then after that, we felt profoundly disillusioned. Interesting. Right. Because in addition to this structure that jumps about chronologically and you've got different forms of communicating the narrative, so it might be a straightforward recounting a story or it might be a postcard or it might be an email. But broadly, it goes through his early years, his middle years and his relationships and his sort of love affairs and his feelings about his immediate family members. and then the third act. And I think, I mean, to say it fell apart for me in the third act would be to undermine the degree to which I really didn't think it was working <laughs> earlier. But yes, definitely at that point, I felt it really lost its way. <laughs> yeah, we very much felt that. I mean, I think we differed from what you've just described in the sense that most of us found it quite convincing. The way that Veronese manages to immerse you so quickly and immediately within the very particular style and content of each of those different fragments, whether they are a text message exchange or it's an email or it's a list. I mean, there's the most fabulous list of pieces of furniture that I have to say was one of my particular favourites. <laughs> one chapter consists entirely and solely of this list of all the items of Italian modernist furniture that existed in Marco Carrera's parents' house. And it's a really great list. And you just, like, oh, oh, and it makes you want to go to the internet. And it's very aspirational. You're like, yes, this is amazing furniture. I'm really happy to read this. Maybe I should just read a furniture catalogue. <laughs> but, you know, I was a bit delighted by it at that point. I thought, I love this. This is so great, the way that he's playing around with this. At that point, I was so pleased with this clever, inventive book. And I loved the way that even through just presenting me with a list of the parents' furniture, actually, he was giving me a whole insight into their place 
within society, you're able to sort of situate them very precisely in a way that feels very pleasing because you're not being told it directly. And I liked that very much. So at that point, I would say I was very on board. And also I was very interested in this character, Marco. You get a bit of his backstory, a sense of his family life. And at that point, I was liking him and curious to see what was going to happen to him. I think where it fell down for me was that, if anything, the degree to which I was interested in him diminished as the book went on. I just felt like the author did not give me enough reasons to care about him. And if you don't care about the main character, then really you're nowhere. You've got nothing. I thought he was lovable. I cared. I'm curious to know what Bill thinks, though, because as I say, he didn't make it to the book club. Yeah, so I think I'm much more on Team Kate here. I loved the sort of structure of the book, and I thought it was very exciting as it got going, jumping chronologically, but also jumping from format to format and dialogues and all of these things. And I thought that was very exciting. I thought all of the other characters were pretty cardboard and one-dimensional. Louisa, his great love, we know nothing about her. And I don't know, I found... So much of them just paper cutouts. Marco himself, I didn't even find fully believable, potentially with Kate. And I struggled, therefore. I actually, in the last third, I know the book club thinks it fell apart then. As I got more and more preposterous, I was just <laughs> sort of more entertained, even though it almost just departed from reality at a certain point. And then it became quite mawkish. But yeah, I was not convinced by the book. We should say he's married to Marina, who is an airline stewardess, who later emerges that he's slightly got to know under false pretenses or a misapprehension about something about her that turns out not to be true, which is interesting. You know, this book is full of really interesting ideas about people and the idea about what is true about people versus what they tell us about themselves. And I felt like there was something sort of interesting there, but it just never really delivered on that idea for me. I just think you guys came to it as critics. Um, I really and I didn't. Think, well, no, but you did because you had all these expectations set up for you by the reviews. It's like the prize effect. If something's been nominated for a prize, you read it with more criticism. If something has had a ton of acclaim, you read it with a different set of expectations. I feel like, and Joe, you could back this up, I don't think the book club was uncritical. I was kind of trying to be critical. I was trying to be a bit critical of these women in his life and the melodrama and everything else. But ultimately, I feel like I was kind of splitting hairs because it's just such a propulsive, entertaining read about this family, this incredible intellectual Italian family. And you get to travel around, you get to go to the seaside, and you get to meet a crazy cast of characters. And the relationship between the parents was incredibly believable. I think his sister's depression and the consequences of that and what it meant for the family and how they came apart. I think there was a lot of substance here. I'll take you on. Yes, because he's married, but he has this unconsummated by mutual agreement passion for his childhood friend, Luisa. And much of the communication in the novel is sort of back and forth between them at various points in their lives, keeping this connection. So she is his real love. I'm with Phil. Louisa. I mean, what do we know about Louisa? Nothing. She's sort of beautiful and she writes nice letters, but there's no depth to her. There's no development apart from what increasingly starts to feel like a male author's ideal woman. And a certain sense of wish fulfillment at the end that I really felt very uncomfortable with. I was like, I don't think you've earned this. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's interesting. I wanted to like it. I opened it expecting I was in for a treat. And actually, for the first third, I really did. As you say, I was very drawn to this affluent Italian middle class cultural elite and the mother's an architect and the father is an engineer and the furniture <laughs> and the summer house on the beach. And, you know, it almost had that quality of, um, oh, gosh, what's that book we did? You know, the one with the peach. Call me by your name. Thank you. Call me by your name. Andre Asselman. That had that quality where you feel like you're in lovely European cultural waters and it's very nice to be there, you know. But then did it actually deliver in terms of a plot? And did it say anything meaningful to me? I, you know, I, I really wanted it to, but ultimately it really didn't. It was the emails, I have to say, that really killed it for me. I was with it. I really was. And some passages I actually got very drawn into. There's a particular very vivid episode where he's recounting his sister Irene who is very depressed and he has an intuition that she's going to kill herself and she goes off to the beach alone and he follows her and he won't leave her alone 
and they go off to this part of the beach where there's this whirlpool and then because he won't leave her be she ends up coming back with him and you know you have the sense that he saved her life and I found that so powerful that story but then it didn't feel like he ultimately did anything with that and it was just sort of left there. Talk a little bit about the writing style because I do think that is what won me over as much as anything. It's very effusive, it's very propulsive and chatty. Joe, you read in Italian and that was very much in the original text. It absolutely was. It's interesting that you say chatty because it is, and yet there's very little dialogue within it as a book. There are maybe two or three chapters which are pretty much dialogue from start to finish, if you can call them chapters, fragments perhaps. And yet the whole tone throughout the book is, yeah, it's very engaging. It's quite whimsical in places. It is, as Kate was saying, it's this tone of a cultural milieu, cultural intellectual milieu, but not in a kind of elitist way, just a very particular kind of linguistic world, I think. And that makes it a very engaging read. In Italian? In Italian. Because I have to say, my first thought, particularly when I got to the emails, is, oh, wow, how much of this is being lost in translation? I really found it quite clunky at points. And it was such a shame because that just ripped me out of my you know nice sense of being in this world it's really interesting you say that because i found the emails not perhaps the first few that i was reading but cumulatively i found actually quite affecting because they were so much about the family dynamics dysfunctional family dynamics and dealing with the aftermath of deaths within the family for example that I found that processing was coming through the language as much as the actual content of what was being written in the emails. So perhaps it is a translation issue. Mm. Well, Charlie spoke to the translation because he began the novel in Italian and then switched to English because book club was coming up quickly. And so he was worried about finishing it. And he did a bit of comparing of the two texts and felt that she had taken more artistic license than he felt comfortable with. I might be misremembering the details, but wasn't one of the things you said, Joe, was that she added in too many adverbs or adjectives? Yes. And that may be, again, the way that, you know, in Italian, you often add suffixes to words. So rather than saying very much, you'll say moltissimo. So you add the issimo onto the end of the word. So I think it's partly how that actually translates into English. But yeah, I think I've come to love this book a bit more than I did originally. And that might be simply because I went back to the text a couple days ago and started rereading it. Was very happy to be back with Marco and his family and the cast of characters. I actually arrived at book club fairly irate about the ending. And I think it's fair to say, you know, the jumping forward in time. So we're actually moving beyond the present day. That doesn't say too much. Yes, because it's the future, doesn't it? Because it goes into the future. And I just thought, what a misstep. And I was texting book club saying, like, he's lost the plot. Literally, it's it's gone walkabout. Like, why? Why has he done this? And if that whole section had just been dumped, I would have been much, much happier. But you sound like you've come around to it. Oh, no, I still hate that ending. I still think that ending was a terrible mistake. And I even recall saying, I don't know if I would recommend this book to people because I enjoyed it so much up until the ending. And Frances was like, no, no, I think it's one to recommend. (laughs) I think she was feeling a little bit under pressure from the rest of us. She's like, I don't think it was that bad, guys. I mean, I I definitely got moved at the end. I mean, you know, one of the things that I find really intriguing about it is that people who respond to it do seem to respond to it on some profound emotional level that I feel really quite concerned that I just don't seem to be able to touch. I mean, what's wrong with me? A mum friend of mine and mentioned to her that we were doing it and she, oh, you know, I read The Hummingbird. I was like, oh, you know, how'd you get on with it? Thinking she might say, oh yeah, you know, I didn't think that much of it. But no, she was like the most extraordinary book. I mean, I was sobbing at one point. I thought, were you really? Because I think it deals with grief and it deals with loss. And what it deals with that I do think is a very resonant topic is, you know, how does one carry on? How do you carry on with your life when you've suffered some terrible loss? You know, how do you have the strength to go on? And that Beckett quote, I can't go on, I'll go on, because that is what we do. And I think in a way, what this book offers is the sort of hope and a kind of solace to people who might be feeling that, whether it's some specific loss that they've experienced or just generalized anxiety about the way the world is going, which is so disturbing and unsettling. And this book, I think, does try to speak to that in a way that I thought was interesting. Yeah, I would. There are a bunch of moments. The scene on the beach, 
also the end of his parents' lives, which I did find moving. I also did in this mawkish ending. I had a lump in my throat. You did. But I, I did, but I felt like I do when I'm on an airplane and I watch The Notebook or something. Like, I felt manipulated <laughs> and gross. And I just resented him a bit for how mawkish it was. It was not a happy cry. It was just like, this is just manipulation. I also want to defend myself retroactively against Laura that about approaching this as a critic. I knew absolutely nothing about this going in, and I just did not feel any of the characters. I think the other thing to say is that reading it as a woman, I found the female characters in particular to be thinly drawn, and I felt concerned about that. I thought that this was a very masculine-centric read. And I suppose it all comes down to how much you like the main character. And unfortunately, I didn't. I'm afraid he rather lost me at the beginning where his daughter, Adele, again, there was a rather lovely, you know, very occasionally he would go into these little episodes that really caught me. I love them. And with his daughter, she has this sense that there is a thread coming out from her and that she can't get it tangled around things. They're concerned. It's like an anomaly, this child who thinks she's got this thread and it's affecting her behaviour. So they end up sending her to see a child psychologist. And the solution is that Marco suddenly starts to take a much more active role in her parenting and he starts to be very hands-on and looking after her. But all that just made me think, well, where were you before? What were you doing before? Like, I wasn't very impressed with this man who suddenly decides to take an interest in his daughter. And then surprise, surprise, things change as a result of that. And I was like, well, yeah, they would. So, you know, fundamental things like that that didn't sit very easily with me and didn't make me very sympathetic towards him. And if you don't feel sympathetic towards him, (laughs) then you're not going to care that much about what eventually happens to him. And then Mirajin, his granddaughter. No, I mean, (laughs) we should just leave Mirajin out of it. (laughs) His daughter Adele has a child. She gets pregnant, the father is not on the scene, and so Adele ends up moving in with her father so that he can be a sort of surrogate father and also literal grandfather to this child whose name is Mirajin, which means man of the future. And while there were some quite nice ideas, I thought, about the idea of this child being a kind of almost like Greta Thunberg character who does offer hope and perhaps a way forward for millions of people who are looking for someone to believe in, she ends up becoming something of a guiding light for people. At the same time, this sort of idea of man of the future and then, okay, so it happened to be female, but that was never really resolved. I felt like he just made her female because otherwise it really would have been like just men, men. I don't know. I don't I have no idea what was going on in his head. I found it confused, very confused. I do think a lot of people love it for the novelty of its approach. So how it is pulled together and how it jumps even around chronologically. I think it was that original. I mean, that's not no, 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 but, super but listen, listen, we read a lot. We read a lot. And I think this is a very easy book to read. It's kind of a family melodrama. It's set in Italy. It's quite glamorous and fun in that way. A lot happens. There's a lot of intrigue. There's affairs. There's betrayal. And that's all wrapped up, that more commercial content is all wrapped up in this fragmentary style. And I think most readers wouldn't have encountered something quite like this. So I think that it's that novelty wrapped up in a commercial package that's made it so, so successful. Yeah, perhaps. And I think also I had a sense that there were lots of Italian cultural references woven in to the text that obviously I was completely missing. That's definitely the case. And I know that when I was reading it, I picked up on some of them. But then when I read the author's notes at the back of the book, I realised quite how many I had missed. I have to say, when I read those notes, that made me reflect quite differently on the book that I had just finished, because I realised quite how rich in influences it was, and how that fragmentary style of writing was also partly an author drawing together really quite diverse influences and inspirations, you know, very much inspirations from different authors, as well as cultural references. But perhaps that's also partly why it keeps you at a distance, I think, even if, as we did in our book club, you enjoy it, we liked it until we got to the man of the future. But I think there is something about the way that he is incorporating those different threads that he's taking from recent and quite historic pieces of literature, fiction, non-fiction, poetry, all sorts of things. And maybe it works as an intellectual exercise, but not so much as an emotional exercise. 
Yeah, I mean, that acknowledgement, he gets to it. So the story I mentioned that had really resonated with me, you know, about Irene and Marco following her to the water and then bringing her back, which I thought was lovely. And he said that this is referencing a story by an Italian author called Beppe Finoglio, which is called The Whirlpool. He says it's a cover version. That story, possibly the most beautiful ever written in Italian, is so inherently perfect. And that perfection wouldn't have come across if I'd simply borrowed the idea behind it without reproducing its structure as well? Because it is precisely in the structure that its perfection lies, that combination of candour and desperation that makes it sound so natural. Therefore, I decided I'd rewrite the very same story, adapting it to the characters in this novel, and trying to preserve the structure and tone as much as possible. It was a powerful exercise for me. In the end, to clearly signal what I was doing, as well as my admiration for Fenoglio, I decided to reproduce the first and last line exactly as they were. And sure enough, they turned out to be the best lines in the whole chapter. I'm like, what? what? It's not even his story. <laughs> it's not even his story. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. It's like even the bits I liked turned out to be someone else's. Well, I think it's a bit naive to think that all authors don't do this in some way. It's just they don't usually talk about their sources quite so much depth. I didn't have a problem with that. I actually, it sort of makes me like it more. I like this idea that this is a massive pastiche <laughs> and it's, he's doing, he's pulling things from everywhere and he's being structurally inventive and sort of source-wise inventive. I don't know. I think that makes it more exciting. Yeah, I know what you mean. It almost makes me like it more, actually. <laughs> it's true. It does. It it's does. quite interesting as well, because also in those acknowledgements and notes, I can't remember exactly which chapters, but there are certain chapters that he had previously published as standalone pieces. And again, you suddenly, I found myself then thinking about it again and thinking, okay, so... I've just read something that ostensibly is a set of fragments, but a set of fragments constructed into a whole. But actually, if some of them were genuinely standalone pieces, that makes me read it in a different way, retrospectively. I mean, it sort of makes me want to read the works of Beppe Finoglio. <laughs> 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 but so overall then, for your book club, it sounds like it was quite a good discussion book. Yeah, I think so. Definitely. And actually, I think it would have been an even better discussion book if Phil had joined us <laughs> to be the sourpuss in the room. Because <laughs> it wasn't for lack of trying. I too made the point. I was like, do you think it's a bit problematic that all the women seem to have issues? And uh, my book they club was like... They all need psychiatrists. Mm. Exactly. Well, that was my point. And my book club was like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like, sorry. I think we, um, so, yes. we found Louisa very cardboardy, but I think we felt that some of the other female characters were rather better drawn. Just in those occasional moments, the sister came through, the mother came through, but they were kind of yeah. flashes rather than consistent. That's fair. And I think, you know, I mean, I do have some insight that I don't think that was the novel that he was trying to write. And on his own terms, he was trying to do something very different. And I think it's just a real shame it was so lost on me. Because I think I've missed out on an experience that obviously has really moved lots of people. And I just, yeah, it, it just didn't work for me. Looking online, there is a nice range of criticism. Jeff Crocker gave it a fair-minded three stars. He said, Sandra Veronese offers all this in multi-layered snippets across time, much of it in the form of emails, letters and phone calls. If you don't read it in one sitting, then you have to remember the thread. All reading becomes disoriented. Veronese frequently interjects his own comments on postmodern society, lamenting, for example, the practice of salespeople discreetly turning away when a customer enters their PIN number into the terminal. Whilst interest is more engaged in the second half, there's no story, no plot, no deeper character study. It is a flat, limp book. While A. Watts had stronger views, only giving it one star, saying, This book didn't engage me, couldn't relate to the characters, nothing to like. And the hopscotching <laughs> style was too difficult to follow. Maybe I could have managed it if I had read it all in one sitting, but I didn't have that luxury. I gave up less than halfway through, not sure where the professional reviewers are coming from with their high praise. And I couldn't resist my favourite review from Salagao Catalina, who wrote, just like The Hummingbird, there's beauty in this novel, but the constant movement between periods, the timeline is just crazy. Luckily, it doesn't matter that much if you keep track of it or not. And subjects works against the development of strong feelings for our protagonist. And that's counterproductive, as The Hummingbird is the story of Mario's life, with its ups and downs, but mostly downs, and his incredible capacity to step in where everything is falling apart around him and to get up after every tragedy. 
I have a lot of admiration for him, but sadly cannot say I cared much about his problems. His marriage issues bored me, his love story annoyed me. The only part I really enjoyed was the story of his parents, and in particular the emails he was sending to his brother, gorgeously describing the story of the items of furniture in the family home. But Tilly gave it five stars, saying, This is one of the most exquisite family sagas I've ever read. And there's something so charismatic and enchanting about Marco, which left me unable to put this book down for a minute. It's strange because this is really a tragic story full of loss and heartache, and yet all I felt whilst reading it was this lightness and joy. Beautifully written, with characters to fall in love with, and incredibly moving. This is a hopeful and charming story, which I hope other readers will fall for as much as I did. Finally, the book doctor gave it four stars, writing, The Hummingbird is playful, inventive, profound, uplifting, and deeply moving. Quite simply, a masterclass in storytelling. Sometimes a piece of literature comes along, once in a blue moon, that reminds you of the cathartic and comforting power of stories, and of the beauty of words in formation, and its final section is one of the most enlightening and refreshingly optimistic visions of the near future I have read in a long time. It should also be added that it is impeccably translated too, which can make the world of difference. A tonic in these troubling times, and a remarkable novel with an abundance of heart, soul, and rich humanity between its pages. Highly recommended. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm glad I read it. I feel like we'd be slightly remiss if we didn't just touch on it, the title, The Hummingbird, because that was a point of criticism. For me, and I think the book club vaguely agreed, the title comes from his nickname. One of the reasons I love this book is there's so many unexpected Easter eggs of stories. And so one example of that is that when Marco was a child, he wasn't growing. He wasn't progressing in terms of height. And so his mother called him the hummingbird. and then. In a rare triumph, his father asserted some parental oversight and said, no, we need to get him some hormonal growth treatment. And he shot up, I think, six inches in eight months in his teens. But Louisa comes back to this name, too, later on in the letter and talks about how he's moving forward like a hummingbird. He's just hovering in place. And actually, I think it's a bit of a red herring. What do you guys think? Do you think it's the right name for this book? Or do you think it's actually, ooh, I don't know, undermining it in some ways? I found it a title that I constantly kept coming back to and wondering about, but a title that I was unconvinced by. And I have to say that whole letter from Louisa, where she talks about him as a hummingbird who's constantly fluttering to stay still. I mean, I think it's one way of describing the way that he's approached his life, but I'm not sure it's one that I wholly agreed with. That sense of constantly being in motion is, I think, something that comes through the book but not necessarily constantly in motion and staying in the same place. That didn't quite ring true for me. I wasn't convinced by it. I pulled that quote out. She says, you really are a hummingbird, and not because you were so little. You're a hummingbird because all your energy is spent keeping still. 70 wing beats per second, only to remain where you are. And you truly are formidable at this. You can keep still as time flows around you. You can stop it flowing. Sometimes you can turn back time even, just like a hummingbird you can fly backwards and retrieve lost time. That's why being with you is so beautiful. That said, what comes so easy to you is almost impossible for other people. It sounds profound, but is it true? Mm. <laughs> that's, why this, yeah. that's why it's a good book club book, because there's a lot to say. We could keep going. I think it's a great book club book, I have to say. I didn't get to discuss it with a book club. I really, I mean, I had you guys. <laughs> this is fine. This has been very satisfying to me, but <laughs> I would very happily have sat with a larger group and yeah, really hashed it out for another good couple of hours. I think I could, I've got notes I haven't even got to yet. <laughs> <laughs> Inspired by the Hummingbird, here are some more recommendations for your next book club book. I thought it'd be nice to recommend books like The Hummingbird that perhaps have been well received in their native countries, but that we might not know so well over here. Jo, did you have one that fitted that rather loose category? I have two, if I'm allowed to. You are. <laughs> one is a very recent book and one is from several decades ago. The more recent one is a book by a German author called Katja Oskamp, and it's a book called Marzahn Mon Amour. Marzahn, my love. And it's a book that I came across because it's published in translation by Peren Press mm. in the UK. And since I read it, it's actually been serialised on Radio 4, I think, as Book of the Week. 
it's very different from The Hummingbird. It's set in Marzahn, which is a suburb of Berlin. I think it was one of East Germany's largest estates of prefabricated kind of high density housing. And it's the story which is based on the author's own biography of a middle-aged woman who comes to a point in her life as a writer where she's not doing particularly well. And so she decides to leave writing behind to retrain as a chiropodist. And then the book is essentially vignettes of the sessions in which she is being a chiropodist for her customers who all come from this housing estate in the suburb of East Berlin. And it's fascinating because it is so much about the relationships, both the kind of physical relationship of someone who, as a chiropodist, is sitting at the feet of her clients and listening to their stories. And it's an incredibly everyday story about the little things. And sometimes there's great loss and sometimes there's drama and sometimes there's eccentricity. It's a small, I think, gem of just being interested in people and listening to and understanding people's lives. So that's my first one. The second one, which is very, very different, is a series which I'm sure will be known to many people, but perhaps not everybody. And that's the Martin Beck series. And for anyone who likes detective novels, it is a series that was co-authored by a husband and wife couple. They're Swedish. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce their names because I'll get it wrong. Um, But I think the the books were written in the 60s. There are 10 or 11 in the series and they are about this police detective called Martin Beck. And I was actually thinking about it when I was reading The Hummingbird because one of the things in The Hummingbird that's very noticeable stylistically is that the main character is nearly always referred to as Marco Carrera with his full name. In the Martin Beck series, he's always referred to as Martin Beck. There's something about that, the full name. It's a crime series that is often cited by contemporary crime writers as being the thing that they took huge inspiration from. It's gritty. It's as much about the human relationships around the police team as it is about the actual crimes themselves. If you want to immerse yourself in a dingy world of Sweden, then it's a very good opportunity to do so. And is that one, if you like crime, Yeah, you would... But if you didn't really like crime, would that not be for you? I think maybe it's one for someone who's already interested in that kind of police detective fiction, that mm. sort of thing. Mm. Joe, what is a chiropodist? Never heard that word. A chiropodist is someone who tends to your feet. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Phil, what are you going to recommend? I'm going to recommend this book I just read while I was in Lisbon called Herrera Maintains by an Italian writer, Antonio Tabucchi. This book is set in the 1930s in Lisbon and is about this very boring literary editor of a sort of second-rate weekly periodical in Portugal who slowly, over the course of the novel, realizes that he has to respond to the growth of fascism in Portugal under the Salazar regime. This novel was written in 1994, just as Berlusconi came to power in Italy. So it was all basically, I think, intentionally written as and received as an allegory for dealing with populism varying on fascism in Italy at the time when it was a bestseller. But you can just, I mean, you can obviously read that today as an allegory for it any number of places in the world. It's also just a very beautiful book set in the 1930s and it gives you a lot of the color and the period details of what Lisbon in the 1930s may have been like. It's not a flashy book, but it's very gorgeous. It's always so nice, isn't it, when you're somewhere to read a book that sort of touches on that place in some way. Indeed. It's one of my things, there must be a bookish word for that very particular pleasure you get when you go somewhere and then you read a book that relates to that place. I always pick... I sort of pick out my literature where I'm going. So anytime I go somewhere, I'm always looking for some history or novel of the place. Well, I've never been to Hungary, but I wanted to recommend a novel by a Hungarian writer, Magda Szabo, which is called The Door. Joe, have you come across this one? No, I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. It's so good. I just randomly picked it up because I think vintage... They've done a whole series of modern classics and they are such beautiful covers. And this one was lying face up in the Hungary section at Dawn Books, where they organise all the books, fiction and non-fiction, by country. So you can do this little world tour just walking around this room at the back. And this was just on the shelf by Hungary. And I picked it up and I just was so attracted by this cover, which is a very simple shot of a tiled floor with a 
glass that's been sort of knocked over. Very simple, but there was something really magnetic about it. And I picked it up and opened it randomly in the middle. And I read a little bit and it was that classic thing where I just sort of stood there rooted to the spot because I was immediately very compelled by it. And I wanted to know it was this writer character who was talking about her housekeeper, her cleaner housekeeper, who had brought these objects back to their house from a kind of junkyard sale that the neighbourhood had been having. So all these items had been left out on the streets and she had brought back these things that she considered to be treasures and given them to the writer. And the little bit that I read was to do with the writer's agony about where to place these things in her apartment because the housekeeper would absolutely know where they were and would care about where they had been placed. And yet the writer knew that her husband would loathe them and she herself (laughs) didn't really much like them. And so just in that little one, you know, vignette, you had this sense of this kind of psychological dynamic, this warfare in a way that was going on between the housekeeper and the writer. And I was very compelled by it. So then I did buy it and I read it over the summer. And it is the most wonderful exploration of this relationship, I suppose. And you've got this writer. And one of the things I particularly loved about it is that clearly many aspects of it resonate with Magda Sabo's own life. She was a writer in her own country, but then politically her work was considered, you know, she wasn't allowed to publish for a long time. And then when she did start writing again, she wrote novels and she became successful. And there are lots of details about the writing life in the book that I really enjoyed that perspective. And it's written with such assurance. It's really, really beautifully written. And you've got these incredibly compulsive psychodynamics going on between these different characters, not so much the husband, who's a fairly unhelpful figure who's in the background for most of it. It's really just these two women and their relationship with each other. And the assumptions that the middle class writer is making about how she can help this woman who is working as a cleaner and a housekeeper, and it comes loaded with all these assumptions. And what I loved is the way that gradually as the story goes on and you learn more of the answers to the questions that are raised, you know, the writer doesn't understand why won't this woman Emerence ever let anyone into her house? You know, gradually these secrets are unlocked and the whole picture starts to fall into place beautifully and at the end of it the writer is changed and you are changed because you've kind of gone on this journey with her i always love books that do that so yeah lovely claire masood quote i made a note of she wrote in the new york times book review sabo's lines and images come to my mind unexpectedly and with them powerful emotions it has altered the way i understand my own life particularly recalled for me Leila Slamani, Elena Ferrante. You know, if you're someone who likes those writers' works, you would love this. I was very, very, very happy to read this. I recommend it highly. Laura. The book I want to recommend is Family Lexicon by Natalia Ginsberg, which was written in Italian and is a family memoir. A family in some ways very similar to Marco Carrera's family. Living earlier, her story really begins in the 1920s and 1930s, and she is the daughter of Giuseppe Levi, who is a scientist with a mania for hiking, and he's very exacting and very difficult, and he lives with his wife and children in Turin, and they're very much in this cultural milieu, and it's very, in some ways, quite glamorous, very interesting, but also because father is Jewish, his wife is Catholic, you have this sense of unease because you know with the rise of fascism that their lives are going to change dramatically. And the memoir takes us through those years as well. Natalia Ginsberg is very well known as an Italian writer. I haven't read her novels, but this memoir in many ways reads like a novel. It's so, so good. It's definitely not as accessible as The Hummingbird. But we did this as a book club book over a year ago now and never got to discuss it on the pod. It slipped through the cracks. It did slip through the cracks. So I'm really glad to put it on everyone's radar now. Family Lexicon by Natalia Ginsberg is a classic and so worth reading. That's nearly it for this episode. Can I just tell you, now that we're alone, that my book club also read The Hummingbird and discussed it the other night and were far less enthusiastic about it than Laura's book club. Comments range from finding Marco a pathetic character, although successfully so, to bemusement over the whole hummingbird conceit that didn't really go anywhere and exasperation with the characters of Louisa and Mirajin. All in all, a writer we all wanted to love, but this book didn't really work for us. But we did love discussing it, so do give it a try. As a book that gets people talking, it's definitely a winner. Other books we mentioned today were Marzan Mon Amour by Katja Oskamp, the Martin Beck novels by Mar... 
the Martin Beck novels by Mai Chauvel and Per Valu, Herrera Maintains by Antonio Tabuki, The Door by Magda Zabo, and Family Lexicon by Natalia Ginsberg. Whenever you listen to this show, you can always leave us a comment at the episode page on our website, thebookclubreview.co.uk, where you'll also find full show notes on all the books discussed today, plus a transcript. Let us know how you feel about The Hummingbird. Are you Team Kate or Team Laura? Comments there go straight to our inboxes and we will reply. You can also sign up for our weekly-ish newsletter, featuring a book of the week plus three hand-picked recommendations and the books we're currently reading. And coming soon, we're launching our Patreon account, where you'll be able to support us and we'll be able to bring you special episodes, book recommendations and more. In the meantime, between episodes, you'll find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Book Club Review and Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod. And you can drop us a line anytime at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. Happy reading.